Welcome everyone to a very special episode of We Are Being Transformed. Here at this podcast, we explore the liminal spaces and contours of reality, the myriad of ways people interact with their world through the vehicles of ritual, cult, and lore. Our guest this evening is Dr. George Boyce Stones. Dr. Boyce Stones is a professor of classics and philosophy at the University of Toronto. A leading scholar of ancient philosophy, George has a special interest in the philosophical movements of the post-Hellenistic period. George, thank you for joining me tonight. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Um, pleasure's all mine. I'm a big fan of your work. Um, and uh, we're talking about uh, your book, Post-Hellenistic Philosophy. Um, I know this is a text you haven't <laughs> visited in a while, but um, I do appreciate you taking the time to talk about the ideas uh, within. So. I wanted to see if we could get a general get a general overview of the development of Stoic exegesis. This is something that was adopted by Platonism, and finally by Christianity. Um, before we get started, there's I just want to preface that there's often a misconception that allegorical reading of texts started with Christianity in the second and third centuries of the Common Era, but in fact, as you point out in the book, the ancients traced allegorical reading of Homer back to the sixth century BCE. Um, it seems that as soon as Homer and Hesiod's works appeared, they were causing problems, so to speak, and people felt the need to remedy these through allegorical method. Um, and really, you pointed out that the allegorical methodology we're familiar with today springs from Stoic thought, translated by a Middle and Neoplatonic thought. So I didn't know if you could tell us a little bit about this process. How did it differ from, say, the allegorical readers of Homer and Hesiod that came prior? Right, yeah. Um, so I, I guess Homer was always already causing problems to himself in a certain way. I mean, he, he's, he's conscious of his own um, symbolic moves. Um, his, his language of the gods is already doing service for, for symbolic uh, ways of thinking about nature and, and human choices and, and fate and so on. So the, the process of finding those other levels of meaning in, Homer starts with Homer, perhaps. Um, how the the, the 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 tradition develops is a lot to do with the way you think about Homer and, and also Hesiod, the other great ancient poet, as figures in the intellectual tradition, so to speak. So one way you might think about them, and I take it this is you mentioned Theogenes of Regium. He's one. I take he thinks that Homer and Hesiod are more or less the the philosophers, the wise men of their day. Um, so he's looking to see how they're thinking about the world. Um, and uh, Theogenes gets some uh, press in, in certainly later antiquity because he's supposed to be the first person who thinks about Homer's um, pantheon systematically as a kind of um, symbolic representation of the physical forces in the world, the elements. So when you get battles between the gods, this isn't really about gods fighting each other, it's about the elements exhibiting different and sometimes opposing forces in the interplay of, of natural um, processes. And so this is the basis for, for what's thought of as an apologetic reading of, of Homer. Homer isn't, as Plato characterizes him, a, a kind of anti uh, or, a, or a negative theological thinker, someone who thinks about the gods as, as sometimes um, malignant forces or contradictory forces. But, but because it has this symbolic meaning um, that's rooted in a, in a philosophical view of the world, it, it makes it theologically um, um, hygienic, as it were, sound. So he's thought of as sort of the first the first apologist for Homer um, in, in the, in the proleptic, yeah, this is before Plato comes along, but he's the, he's the answer that's already there when Plato is criticizing Homer. And he thinks that because um, he thinks of Homer and Hesiod as being, as I say, the kind of the philosophers of their day. Um, so that's one thing you might think about them, uh, and, and I think we'll, we'll see other people who think that in the course of this conversation. But another thing you might think is that they're not themselves really philosophers, that, that, that being a poet is a different kind of thing, it's more about entertainment than about, than about thought. So in that case you might think that what's interesting about Homer and Hesiod is that they um, kind of draw on earlier traditions of storytelling or, or of thinking about the world. Um, and that in general, traditions of mythology and, and uh, religious ritual as well, um, transmit um, traditions of, of, of thought and, and wisdom 
Um, and that what becomes uh, interesting about Homer is that you might be able to discern through this, the earliest written poem that we have, which is why we keep going back to him, but you might be able to discern through that even e earlier um, uh, ways of thinking about the world. Um, and of course, that's quite intriguing. I mean, that's, that's in itself historically um, enticing to think that you might be hearing the voices of very early people, perhaps even the very earliest people. Um, I think what happens a little bit later on um, through Plato's thinking, through Aristotle's thinking, but then in the, in the Stoa, is that um, th there's a particular view that emerges that, that earlier people have a, somehow a kind of purer, uh, more innocent way of thinking about the world. So that knowing what they think isn't only interesting, it's not just intriguing, enticing, but it's actually potentially quite informative, that it might actually have something to contribute to a philosophical conversation, to think what would it be like to think about these issues um, before um, the complications of a technological society and, and, the, the, and the complexities of political life in between. So, so there the comes to be this interest of looking towards Homer and Hesiod, not as themselves thinkers about the world, but as, as kind of evidence conduits for, for earlier thinking that we could sort of rescue and, and somehow use. Um, so one thing to say about early Stoics in, in relation to Homer and Hesiod, this was, this was a sort of revolution in the literature a few decades ago when, when this started coming to people's notice much more, is that they really don't like Homer and Hesiod. They don't think that Homer and Hesiod are these great, clever, allegorical um, philosophers. What they think actually is that they're kind of rather stupid um, poets and they're just doing entertainment. But the, the exactly the value of that is that they're passing on without too much uh, intervention of their own, this kind of pure, primitive, innocent uh, perspective on the world that you can find at the core of their, of their mythologies. That's fascinating. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's very, um, I just found it very intriguing that, um, you know, Homer and, and Hesiod are obvious, obviously um, monoliths unto themselves in terms of transmission mm. history. Um, and I just found it fascinating how the Stoics um, could see uh, these poets as perhaps sometimes misunderstanding, uh, but nonetheless transmitting some truth that they could get to through this um, very interesting method, which I wanted to ask you about. So mm -hmm. what was the process by which Stoics, Stoics believe they could get this wisdom from an earlier age? Um, so it, a fairly simple um, set of tools to begin with, I think, that the, the, the key to it is um, not so much allegory, as people often emphasize, but, but etymology, actually. So what you do is you look at the names that the gods have, the names of the actors in, in our mythologies. Um, and I think the thinking there is that, um, well, the process goes like this. You have, you have these people very early on in history, maybe right at the beginning of human history, in fact, um, who have a certain kind of view of the world, which they express a certain kind of way. And then later on, the poets come along and they pick up uh, these accounts, but they misunderstand. And they misunderstand um, references to elements of the world as being references to actual people or actors or gods. Um, so the names that the gods have in Homer, this is the sort of key insight, the names that the heroes have um, aren't really weren't originally supposed to be the names of, of people or gods. They're actually references to things in the real world. So if we start, and they're exactly the things that the poets are least likely to have messed around with. So the poets will embroider new stories around um, the 12 gods of the Olympian par uh, pantheon, for example. They'll tell a new story about Zeus, but they won't mess with the name Zeus. So you've got the name Zeus. So what do you do with that? Um, well, you think about where that name comes from. And there are all sorts of theories about this. Um, it, it's related somehow to the Greek word for, for through, and so Zeus is some kind of process through which the world comes to be, is, is a standard way of attacking Zeus. Hera is, is a, an easy one, so Zeus' sister and wife, Hera, uh, is linked, is very close to the Greek word for air. Uh, air. So um, Hera is really a reference. So all the stories about Hera um, originally kind of claims about the way air works or the way air relates to fire or 
water or, or whatever it is. So that, that um, sort of unpacking of names, thinking about the origin of names is really key. And then once you've done that, you can sort of see how these names relate to each other, how the, the elements in this case um, are being posited in relation to each other within the stories. And where the stories kind of make sense as physics, once you've translated all the names back into the elements, you can, you can think you've probably got a bit of primitive insight there. And where it doesn't make sense, or there's contradictions or something else happens, well, that's obviously where the poets have, have made up some, um, some things of their own. Um, so it's quite an interesting, I, I find this a very fascinating process. I mean, it's, it's not that anyone at, at any point in this process is deliberately forming allegories, um, but that a sort of original discourse about the world is being misunderstood into a sort of de facto allegory, which is what we, what we get in Homer. And the, the trick is to distinguish the bits of Homer that might be um, uh, misunderstandings of this original uh, thought from the bits that are just poetic um, addition. That's basically the, the early stoic method, I think. Well said, thank you for that. Um, yeah, um, I also wanted to touch upon something that I, I didn't, I don't, I'm not, not sure if I actually put it the, in the agenda, but um, I wanted to add this to the questions. So um, I know I'm, I'm gonna ask about the concept of rationality, but I also wanted to ask, um, so I'm gonna cut right here and then I'm going to start this question. Um, so, yeah, it's very fascinating. Um, I didn't know if you could also explain just how the stoic conception of the cyclical uh, conception of the world and the, the stages and ages of man mm. uh, tie into this and how this um, knowledge is transmitted. Yeah, um, that's a really great question because it, it relates to a, a sort of prior stage in the story which concerns Aristotle, actually. As a sort of walk on part in the story, because Aristotle, so I'm not talking about the Stoics now, but by contrast with him, that Aristotle thinks that the world is eternal, so there have always been people. Um, but he has a problem with that, which is if there have always been people, um, we should know everything by now. We should have done everything by now. Um, and we clearly don't. So what he thinks is that there are periodic stages in world history where there are massive floods, earthquakes, whatever, basically civilization gets destroyed, but somehow humanity survives. And they, they happen regularly, but fairly infrequently. So what Aristotle thinks is that kind of towards the end of those historical cycles, you have people who are very sophisticated, who really are close to understanding um, everything. In fact, Aristotle himself says that he thinks he's there. He thinks he's really within a generation of knowing everything, um, which is Aristotle for you, but anyway, there, these, this is how these cycles work. But one of the things that happens at, at these sort of historical, at these um, sort of periodic turns, um, is that the people who survive, who tend to be the people living up on mountains, um, out of harm's way, so shepherds, so not necessarily the most educated people. Nevertheless, they they picked up some things, um, and so what you get is fragments of the knowledge that was accumulated in the period in the previous cycle, surviving over that process. Um, into the sort of folklore and sayings um, of, of, of you know, people in general in, in the current cycle. So Aristotle, he doesn't do very much with this, but he does occasionally say, you know, this is why we talk about the stars as gods, for example, because this is the sort of folk memory, if you like, of the, of the philosophy of the previous um, cycle. And, and he says, we don't have evidence of his doing this, but he says if you, if you go around looking at, at popular sayings, you can, you can find these fragments lying around. So that, that's very relevant to Aristotle's relationship to this idea about going back to a, a previous um, historical phase to find, to find insights. Um, the Stoics also believe in cycles, um, but unfortunately their cycles uh, destroy the entire world, so nothing survives in terms of human um, invention or, or, or discovery. Um, so for the Stoics, it's, uh, people sometimes conflate these two things, but it really has to be very different because, as I say, nothing survives. Everything starts again. Um, so what the Stoics think um, is that um, the world is, is finite in duration, but repeating. Um, and this seems to be linked to the idea that um, if God's going to make the perfect world, it needs to, he needs to know how it ends, as it were, right? So you can't make a perfect infinite world. Um, uh, so you make the same world over and over again. That, that's kind of how it works here. Yeah. 
So the world doesn't ever get very, very old. Um, um, and every single time, um, the same things happen. And what happens is that uh, humans are somehow born from the Earth. It's a bit unclear how that happens, but there's very clearly a first generation of human beings. Um, and they're born without any knowledge of anything that's happened before. So it all has to start again. So actually, what's, what's, what the Stoics think is important about getting back to the early people is not that they have any kind of memory, folk memory, whatever kind of memory of anything that went before, but it's exactly the fact that, that it, anything that they said, they've said without, as it were, the possibility of error. They haven't had time to make mistakes yet. So they have this very fresh, very innocent view of the world. Um, and that's why, that's exactly why they're interested, precisely because you don't have that continuity. That's fascinating. Yeah, thank you for that distinction. Um, just getting back to the methodology and exegesis of the Stoics, how does the Stoic conception of rationality tie into this method? Right, so it's very important that the, the Stoics, um, again, to make another contrast with Plato this time, Plato, if you know anything about Plato, you might know that he has this very rich theory of rationality which connects with um, the forms, um, and, and all knowledge is, is sort of recollection of, of some previous state where you experience these, these things. Um, the Stoics, by contrast, have um, uh, uh, are empiricists, which means that all of the, the stuff going on in our heads comes from our experience of the world. We don't bring anything into the world with us. There's no forms, there's no recollection of any sort. Um, we come into the world as blank slates. They, they invent that metaphor, which gets taken up later. So everything we think about the world comes from the experiences that we have of it. Um, and the reason that's relevant here is because um, well, for us now, our experience as children includes all of the stuff that our parents tell us, include all of the stuff that the society around us um, feeds us in terms of values and, and, and theories and, and orthodoxies and so on. So it's very hard for us in this age to trust our own intuitions, as a matter of fact, because uh, we, we've fed so much um, stuff, some of which must be wrong um, for, for various reasons. So the, the thought is that if you have this kind of theory of mind, um, but you have generations of people so early that there is no societal civilization accumulation of, of, of orthodoxies that prejudice the question, they will just get a, a really sort of simple but really clear and accurate perspective on the world. That matters particularly for ethics, for example. So if one thing that they're very keen on is um, where you where you place value in, in ethical terms and um, they think that a large part of our problem is that we're brought up nowadays in societies that, that put a lot of um, weight on reputation and, and prestige and money and um, good looks and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the first people wouldn't have had that because they wouldn't have had anyone telling them that. They, they just have a sense of their place in nature and that's really what, what the Stoics want to get back to in their ethics too. So it's that very sort of, um, that very kind of pure relationship with, with nature that the Stoics are positing in their theory of mind that, that is that's relevant here, I think. Thank you for that amazing answer. I appreciate it. Um, so when we get to the figures themselves who are practicing this Stoic exegesis, allegory, etymology, um, there are two figures who really stand out for me. Uh, and the first one is absolutely a paradigm shift, paradigm shifting um, in this type of thought. Um, that would be, of course, Posidonius. So I didn't know if you could tell us a little bit about mm. Posidonius and his methods. Sure. Um, so Posidonius uh, was born um, around, three, I think, 135 BC, um, lived and worked on the island of Rhodes. Um, so he's uh, about 150 years into the history of the Stoic school, and he's a, 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 a sort of revolutionary figure, a uh, bit of a sea change. Um, he's very, very interested in history, and he's quite influential on, on the practice of history. He's also very influential on, on science, um, the, uh, the major preoccupations of his. We don't have any of his works, so as with all of these people, we've lost uh, all, everything they've written, really. Um, but but he, his, his influence is, is massive and, and we can see that through other people. Now he's not actually, one of the things he isn't interested in is, is allegory um, or, or poetry 
very much, in fact. But he's very relevant for the story because one of the, the radical things he does is to um, challenge the, the view of the soul and the mind that we've just been talking about, um, that, that in, in many ways has been quite uh, not only characteristic but almost definitional of, of Stoicism up to his point. In fact, it remains very controversial what he actually thought about this because it seems so radical. But um, it basically goes like this. The earlier Stoics think that um, human decision-making is almost entirely, is entirely rational, really. It's, about, it's entirely about what you believe. So your, your rationality dominates, leads the whole of your relationship with, with the world and life. And that means um, that emotional surges, passions, all of those things are, are real, of course, but they come out of your beliefs. Your emotions are really manifestations of your beliefs. You know, you get angry because you believe someone has has um, threatened you, but that's a belief, really. So anger, even even something like anger, is a belief. Now, um, that's important because when we talk about this sort of pure, unsullied view that the early Stoics think, that, sorry, yes, that the early Stoics think that early human beings had. Um, part of that purity is that their, their perspective on the world isn't distorted by sort of free-floating emotions. They don't, they're not emotionally driven. They're, they're driven by, by their, their sort of understanding of the world. Posidonius thinks that's just not true, basically. He's very, he's very influenced by Plato and Aristotle. Uh, he doesn't revert to them entirely, but he thinks that, that the Stoics have, have sort of thrown the baby out with the bathwater a bit with them. And both Plato and Aristotle think that a lot of our actions and decisions have to be explained by entirely independent movements of, of emotion, passion, even sometimes contrary to the things we believe. Um, and that's a lot of the, the issue with human psychology. And Posidonius, as I say, it's a little bit unclear and controversial how he shoehorns this back into a stoic system, but he clearly thinks that actually the emotions, the passions do have powerful, independent existence in our lives and, and sometimes oppose what we believe. Now, why is that relevant? The reason that's relevant is because if you now think about how early people operated, if you now think about them popping out of the earth or however it is they come to be, but the first generation of humans, um, not of course being evolved, I mean that, that's not on the table, but they're actually, they emerge as human beings in a generation. But they're driven by emotions, anger, selfishness, greed, whatever. Um, how are you gonna get them, you know, how are they gonna survive? How are they not going to just fall into battle with each other immediately? Um, how are we gonna get these creatures surviving and living in communities? And this is something Posidonius worries about. He actually clearly did write about this and we have fairly good evidence for what he thought um, from a later discussion of this topic in Seneca. And what he thinks is that given these emotions, you have to have something counterbalancing that in, in, in the rational part of the mind. So he thinks, um, and in a way this is the, the, the most extraordinary part of his, his theory here, he thinks that among early human beings, there have to have been quite sophisticated, reflective, explicit philosophers because you need to have that kind of explicit, reflective understanding of the world in order to keep your emotions in check. And if there hadn't been actual philosophy, proper sort of theoretical, scientific understanding of the world in the community, there wouldn't have been a community. There wouldn't have been people capable of, of bringing people together and, and seeing the bigger picture. So Seneca has this, this extraordinary view that the, first, the very first generations of human beings were already philosophically um, uh, sophisticated. So it's not just innocent appreciation of the world, it's a, it's a positively philosophical um, understanding of it that he, he brings in um, to the picture. Now he doesn't go anywhere with that, but you can see that if that's the case, and this is why you, you talk about this as a sort of paradigm shifting, but I think this is why it might be, because if that's the case, then if it's also the case that you can somehow hear the voice of these early people, then you're not just hearing the voice of innocence, you're hearing the voice of innocence plus some sort of technical theory, some sort of technical understanding of the world. And that would be super interesting to know about. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, so you're not just hearing the voices of these um, autocathons who are just like right. innocent and living right. along, you know, with the, uh, 
the good i mean you're, you're actually hearing um the voices of yeah the the philosophers and the kings and things like that very interesting and just to say i mean so so one way of cashing that out is that the early stoics really only seem to have thought that that is um, ethics that you get from the, the early people but i think possibly is quite explicit that they have physics metaphysics too they have the whole back you know the whole uh gamut of philosophy going on there. right um doesn't he also believe that they also have um architecture things like things like these like these uh maybe not architecture but what am i saying me like they can they know how to like uh do the arts and things like yeah. this or am i getting yeah. that correct i know right so one one question i mean one one question is if, if civilization is so bad for us in the end, uh, why does it happen? So why do people start um, becoming uncomfortable with what nature provides? And the early Stoics don't have a great answer for that. They just think it sort of you know, comes about and then it's bad for us and then we all suffer from the consequences of the unnatural ease that we live in nowadays and then we just want more and more and, and it's all very disruptive. Um, and actually one of Posidonius's arguments for his way of, of cutting things is that if you have people who are technologically reflective at a very early period, and they need to be because they, they have a sort of technological job of work to do with our own um, social interactions, um, then as it were that the seeds of civilization are already, you, you know, the history of civilization is already seeded in that. Um, so there's this constant dialectic in his sort of history of humanity between um, between um, our, our pull to, to greed and our, our ability to constrain it and that manifests itself in the development of, of civilizations too yeah. I love that um, I would I would love to have Posidonius uh, in the 21st century for just one day just to right. hear his uh, <laughs> reflections on yeah I know um, love him um, so we're going to move on to another figure who's, um, I believe, just as important in the development of the Stoic method, uh, that of Cornutus. So Cornutus inherits from Posidonius a similar allegorical uh, methodology of reading the text, you know, the allegory, the um, etymology, all of these things. Um, so he, him and other Stoics like Caramon um, seem to have this in common. So. Is it safe to say that these are common koine, uh, so to speak, of the time among the Stoa? Um, tell us more about Cornutus. Tell us more about yeah. where this method is at this time with Carimon, Cornutus, um, these Stoa figures. Yeah, so it, it, as I say, Posidonius himself doesn't show any signs in our evidence for him anyway of having done, um, applied his thinking to, to um, the reading of Homer or to have seen through implications of this for, for the exegetical allegorical method. But Cornutus and Chiremon are the two, uh, kind of the first people we do see Posidonius's implications being worked through with. Um, they're both, they're really, they, they do seem to be key figures. Um, so later on uh, in the third century, Porphyry um, has a list of, of people he thinks of as the great exegetes of the, of the um, traditions. And Porphyry's a Platonist. He lists only Platonists, except the first two people on his list are Cornutus and Chiremo, who are Stoics. So it looks like they 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 do they are certainly thought of as being quite cardinal in this story. Um, so I mean, I've got more to say about Cornutus in a way because we have much more information about him. Chiremo is super interesting because he was an Egyptian priest, so he, he gets very interested in Egyptian um, traditions uh, in particular. But Cornutus. Um, so he's he's really a fascinating figure. Um, he's a, a North African, probably a Carthaginian. Um, occupies the, the sort of uh, middle of the first century AD, probably born between ten and twenty. Um, and he goes to Rome. He, he's moving in very uh, elevated circles there. He's he's an absolute polymath. He he is at least trilingual. So he must have I think spoken Carthaginian and Latin and Greek. Um, he writes about Latin language very interestingly. He's the first person, more, pretty much the first person, I think, who, who writes a commentary on Virgil. Um, so he's very interested in poetry. He teaches uh, the poet Perseus and Luca, actually. So he's very interested in poetry, which is relevant here, of course. Um, but he's also uh, um, very engaged in technical Greek philosophy. He, he has contributions to make 
patterns and logic and, and so on and so on. But the work that we have that survives of his is, is um, he was best known for in antiquity too, is um, it's called the Greek theology. And basically he gives us a rationalizing, allegorizing account of, of um, the Greek theological tradition in it. Um, which is a bit listy in a way, but you, so it's not the greatest read sort of, except that I mean every bit of it is, is just fascinating and you can, and the most fascinating thing is to see how he, how he's working to get to these, um, uh, to, to, to the kind of theories that he has. Um, and, and you're right, I think Cornutus clearly, I mean sort of more explicitly than, than anything we know of Chiron, is developing a, a Posidonian anthropology. So he says he, th he says that the first human beings were philosophers, just as Posidonius says. So he's aligning himself with Posidonius against the earlier Stoics and saying that. But he also says um, they he says something like they were inclined to express themselves allegorically. So not only were they philosophers, but they were also quite deliberately. So remember with the the story earlier on with the early Stoics is that the first people just said what they thought about the world, and then that gets misunderstood by the poets. In Cornusa's pretty much for the first time, I think that's not, it, the story is, is, is much more sort of straightforward. The, the first people are themselves expressing a philosophy in deliberately allegorical form. Um, quite why they did this is a little bit unclear. It might be that um, they thought that was exactly the way to prevent it from getting misunderstood and corrupted. It's a way of encoding it and protecting it from, from um, corruption. Or maybe they didn't want it to get into the hands of people who wouldn't understand it, or something like that. It's a bit unclear, but they did that. And then the exciting thing about that is that when that, that when we start looking at Homer, Hesiod, the mythological traditions in general, we're no longer trying to sort of clear away. Well, we're partly trying to clear away things that have been misunderstood. But what we're going to get to is not just the the names and, and some little bits and pieces about how how the elements that stand behind the divine names relate to each other, but we're going to find fragments of stories that, that can be interpreted as actual philosophical theories expressed allegorically. So that's the, that's the sort of revolution here, that we can get through a, a, a reading of Homer. Not all of it, it's not that all of Homer, they still at this point are thinking that Homer is um, uh, a, a poet, an entertainer, cares more about entertaining his audience than preserving philosophy, doesn't understand it himself. Um, but he's going to be passing on actual encoded philosophy. But then here's the thing, this, this is where it gets, I think, particularly interesting with Cornutus. Um, if you think about how this works, so we're thinking about the first generations of human beings now, or the philosophers among them, deliberately constructing allegorical philosophical stories that get transmitted down the poetical line. Of course, that's not just going to happen in Greece. That's going to happen through all of the mythological lines that, that have any antiquity in the world. So I think the thing that, that's, to me, most exciting and interesting about Cornutus is that he, he gets, although his book is about Greek theology in particular, the Greek tradition, He's very, very interested in what other ancient mythological traditions have to say. Because one of the ways in which you can guarantee the antiquity, the originality of a bit of philosophical allegory, is if it recurs in parallel mythological traditions that have no, as far as he's concerned, have no other um, contact with each other. Um, so, for example, he, he mentions the example of um, the story of Demeter and Persephone in, in, in the Greek tradition being a, quite like the story of Isis and Osiris in the Egyptian tradition, and quite like the story of Adonis and so on and so on. It was a rebirth of the crops kind of story. So he says, here you can see there's, there's a story that, that they all have. It's pretty much the same. You can see little bits added here and there, but basically the core is the same. So that must be a really ancient um, part of the, of the tradition. So he does, he, we, we see for, for the first time this, this um, real interest in world mythologies, essentially, and a, and a sort of method of comparative, myth, comparative mythology, is fair to call it, I think, as a tool for um, allegorical exegesis. Um, yeah. That was a great answer. Thank you. Yeah, it brings to mind two observations for me. One was just getting to this point where, um, you know, Cornutus and, and Carrimon and the Stoics of this day believe that these 
lines of knowledge were transmitted intentionally as allegories and as poetry, it brings to mind almost the um, what I guess what I would call a social capital of mystery and um, things like that at the time. You have mystery uh, cults and things like that going on. Um, you know, s secrecy and um, mysteries brought kind of a social capital to your uh, methodology. And also, it, it, it's really interesting just thinking about how he could come to these conclusions, but also they don't really have a hermeneutical tool to narrow down what you can uh, sift from the bad stuff and the good stuff. Like, um, of course, the, the middle and then the later Neoplatonists would use Plato as that yeah. benchmark. Yeah. Um, but at this time, it's just very interesting. Um, no, that's a great point. I mean, both points are really helpful because that they use the mysteries as a kind of paradigm for what they're doing. Exactly this. This is what allegory is. It's hiding um, uh, sophisticated knowledge from a, from a, 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 an audience that will uh, not treat it with sufficient respect or might or might change it or, or, or whatever. And the, the process of allegory is like the process of initiation and mysteries. They they do say that. Um, and yeah, the other point, very good. Yes, why you know what do you get out of this? I think it's true. There's no sense in Cornutus that you can, or Kyrie, for that matter, that you can learn anything new because you you have to sort of be able to recognize that the philosophy is there, uh, um, the, the methodology, precisely because there is so much rubbish in the mix, the, the methodology requires you to be a, a bringing your own philosophical understanding to bear on this. So that's right, you can you can sort of confirm, I think that's, that's the thought, you can sort of confirm that you're on the right lines and you can give yourself a bit of rhetorical back up against other schools if you can say, well, look, this is what people always thought. Um, but you can't just open a page of Homer and discover some new theory about the stars or something. Like that. Yeah, great point. Um, it's also very interesting. Um, just uh, this, they're still at this point really looking, I mean, there's an interest, like you said, in looking at these um, world lore, the lore in the world, like the myths and other terms. Um, you know, they're looking at Egyptian myth, they're looking at Hebrew mm. myths, things like this. Um, but they're still interpreting it through that, uh, the lens of the interpretatio Greca in, in, a, in a way. It's very interesting. Um, I I was talking to another scholar, Matthew David Litwa, about how Philo turns this on its head. Um, and he's, in a sense, uh, trying to out-Greek the Greeks with his life of Moses. Um, yes. So it's very interesting. Um, also, um, I think this gets to my final question for this segment. Um, Platonism is very interesting to me. It seems to um, be very um, malleable and adjust itself to the thought, cur the currents and thought of the time. So um, the Stoic uh, methodology is no exception. Um, so I didn't know if you could talk about the impacts that these developments had on later Platonic thought, uh, obviously mm. culminating in the approaches of um, philosophers like Plotinus and Porphyry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so oddly enough, though, the, the, the book of mine that you were kind enough to, to wave earlier on um, it was supposed to be about Platonism. <laughs> Don't get to it until about two thirds of the way through, because I, I think so. One of the great mysteries with with Platonism is is kind of where it comes from, and I, I'm not sure that I think exactly what I thought when I wrote that book, but, but still, but it's it is still a great mystery because really we don't see it being invented. We we see the results of it. We don't see its emergence. So you've got Plato in the fourth century, Aristotle. The Hellenistic period, third century through to the end of the first century BC, let's say, and then suddenly halfway through the first century AD, there are Platonists, and they're sort of fully formed, and we don't know where they came from. Or, or um, uh, there are lots of theories about this, of course, but but you, there's no smoking gun; it's not clear. Um, and they're distinguished by the fact that they they go back; that they're, they're now treating Plato like a um, source of authoritative doctrine, and and they see their job as being, or they see the way forward in philosophy, let's say, as being to understand why Plato said what he said. Um, but the working assumption, at least, is that he was right. Um, and this is quite strange. I mean, it's not, it's not the philosophy that we've had for the past 400 years. Um, it's not even how the people we know about are reading Plato, um, even the people who are interested in 
so it's a slightly mysterious phenomenon. And actually, what m motivated my project when I when I out of which that book came originally was to think, well, you know, why on earth would you say that? And why would you why would you suddenly think that the way to do philosophy was to latch on to the authority of this figure and, 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 and run with that? And so I was coming at that from various angles. And, and I my, my thought ultimately was that um, I was very interested by the fact that they, um, um, the, the biographies of Plato, you get quite a lot of biographies of Plato at this time, and they're all very keen, they're all very interested in um, the thought that Plato traveled very widely um, without any real historical precedent for this. I mean, we know Plato probably maybe went to Egypt, he certainly went to Sicily, places around the Mediterranean, but now they have him going off to India and they have him going to the Celtic lands and, 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 and Persia and just all over the place, um, explicitly to engage with the wisdom traditions of those cultures. And so my thought was, um, well, hold on a minute, we've got, with Cornutus, as I just said, we've got this sudden interest in, in the Stoic exegetical tradition, in um, the, the wisdom traditions of other cultures, as a hermeneutical device for establishing you know, the kind of philosophical core of, 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 of the mythologies. So maybe the thought is with Plato, I mean, there needs to be other things going on too, this can't be the whole story, but maybe part of the story with Plato is that people are thinking that the reason Plato has such authority um, and, and it, it rewards thought with so much is that he had done this, that he, he's, he's actually traveled the world, taught to, to the, the representatives of these wisdom traditions. Um, and, and, and kind of done that work of reconstruction that Cornutus was, was talking about and distilled it into the dialogues that we, we have now. Um, so that was my thought. And, and, and then the idea would be you would, you would look to Plato as um, uh, a distillation of, of, of you know, the, philosophy, the, the primitive philosophy, the original philosophy. Um, and that would be, if you believe that, that would be at least a reason for taking Plato very seriously and, and might be part of the reason why he suddenly acquires this, this strange kind of authoritative um, uh, position. Um, and uh, yeah, as you say, I mean, that, 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 so we get figures like um, Plutarch in the first, second century, um, lots of other little figures um, around that period. And then, and then uh, Plotinus in the, in the third century, who, who really becomes the, foundation for a whole um, tradition. I mean, we don't get so much uh, exegetical interest in, in Plutarch the times, but even he, you find these extraordinary passages where he's suddenly very interested in Egyptian hieroglyphics out of the blue. Um, so it's, it's certainly in the background there, I think. Yeah, well said. Great point about Plato. It's very um, strange that um, there's a misconception, I think, in the general public that uh, before the Bible, Homer was the Bible of right. antiquity. But as you're showing, like nobody considered Homer some authority, like they considered Plato an authority. Um, and I think you, yeah, you're right. Um, because Platonism was so malleable and and um, it could intake so many different sources, it's also taking a lot of Pythagoreanism, right? And you also yes. have that figure of Pythagoras yes. and the the figure of the pagan holy man is very important in um you know this movement of time um you have later things like the bio of um you know plotinus and proclus by by their students right mm -hmm. um it's sure. very um these provide paradigmatic um kind of ways of living for people and and like you're saying like um somebody like plotinus while well, he doesn't necessarily um have that much of an interest in the exegesis that's going on he, he, you still see that as a current and then that ultimately find, um, you know like the the um the interest he has in the egyptian hieroglyphics and yeah. hieroglyphics and you find that um culminating obviously and in, in, uh, in most fullest form in somebody like iamblichus right right so exactly. yeah. yeah it's very um very interesting um Plato, Plato, I think, yeah, like you were saying, is just uh, an example of um, somebody distilling all this wisdom by traveling widely. You even see it in somebody like Diogenes Laert Laertius, right? Book one, the first thing he says is, yeah, philosophy, you know, 
is the same thing as they practice uh, with these in these exotic eastern <laughs> provinces and the magi and things like that so very interesting um who knows ultimately where it came from um but dr boy stones george this has been a pleasure thank you so much um, and we'll you. see you again soon thank you very much Jake. take care